So welcome everybody to the first Tango Kernel webinar. And so this uh, webinar will be uh, presented by uh, myself, uh, so Renal Bourtambour. Uh, I'm working at the ESRF, the Synchrotron in Grenoble, uh, by Thomas Brown, who is in uh, Berlin and works for Byte Physics, and Michel, uh, who is uh, working for S2 Innovation in Poland. And uh, so I will I will start uh, with an introduction. Um, so um, I will start with a, a brief overview of the CPP Tango repository, and then I will uh, talk about the dependencies that we are required to be able to build the Tango C++ library. And then uh, I will, uh, uh, well, Thomas will, will, con will go on with uh, how to compile CPP Tango and will present how to run the test and how to add a new test. And then finally, uh, Michel will, do, will present a, an architecture overview and uh, also a practical example with uh, which and it will show you what happens when an attribute is is read is read um, and then uh, you will be involved uh, and you will be, have the possibility to ask some questions um, so the goal and the ideas behind this uh, kernel webinar is to uh, sh share the knowledge on, on the tango kernel and uh, many before the Tango creators uh, retire or get uh, affected by uh, Alzheimer or uh, men in blacks, you never know. Um, and also to, of course, un un encourage uh, and foster contributions uh, to Tango kernel. And uh, we will try to do uh, about one webinar per month um, and uh, it will be on different topics on the Tango kernel. So on the, the first, first two will be on the Tango C++ library, but uh, we intend to provide, uh, to present as well some uh, webinars about uh, JTango and PYTango and uh, also uh, some tools like Astor, uh, Pogo, uh, the, the starter and things like that as well and uh, of course we we can discuss at the end of this meeting and uh, we you can share as well your uh, uh, what you would like to what you would like us to present and uh, where you would like to 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 know a bit more so uh, and of course, yeah, you have a, the idea is to have a question and answer session at the end. So let's start with a, an overview of the uh, CPP Tango um, Git, GitHub repository, well, Git repository and also GitHub repository. Um, so if you have done your homework well, you, you've already been there and you've already cloned the repository. So to do that, you just go there and, and then you can do a git clone of this. Um, so it's a standard GitHub repository. Of course, you have issues, uh, pull requests, you can create some issues there. <laughs> and uh, you have a nice readme. Uh, <laughs> with links to the documentation and how to contribute. I will uh, go back on this uh, topic later on. And uh, the, here you have the important branches. Uh, we, have, we are mainly working on, on two branches right now, and there is even another one which has been active in, in the past, but that we will revive at some point, uh, the master branch. 
But the default branch is a Tango 9 LTS branch. And we have a 9.3 backport branch uh, for uh, Tango 9.3 binary compatible uh, long-term support development version. Um, then uh, we, we have some continuous integration uh, set up on our repository. So when uh, you do uh, a pull request, so if we go to the pull request, and for instance, I'll take this one. Um, when you do a pull request, then uh, for each uh, commit that you, you do, or at least uh, the, the latest one, then you have some uh, checks, some automatic uh, checks that have to pass. You can see them there, or you can see them at the end of the pull request. And here, so if you do a pull request, uh, this test will be executed automatically, and then you will get the result. And of course, for the pull request to be accepted, normally all the checks should, should pass. Um, uh, of course, sometimes there can be some exceptions, um, but uh, this, this should be really exceptional. And here are all the checks that we are doing. So we, are, uh, we have some Travis continuous integration uh, uh, tests, which are there. Um, so we are running some tests on different uh, operating system with different uh, compilers. So we have the latest uh, uh, LLVM um, compiler, for instance. Uh, we have uh, as well the latest uh, GCC, uh, and we are running on Ubuntu, Debian 10, 9, 8. So this is for Tango 9 LTS, and for the other branch, uh, the 9.3 backports branch, then we have some older uh, operating systems as well. We have, I think the oldest is Debian 7. Um, so we have, so this is for Linux uh, and um, we have as well, oops, sorry. Uh, we have this, the equivalent for uh, Windows um, which is Abveo. Um, so for Abveo, uh, we are actually not running uh, automatic tests. We are just building, but on different, uh, with different uh, compilers on different uh, architectures and 32-bit and 64-bit. And uh, also, we are producing some artifacts there, which are uh, just some uh, very simple installers to, to be able to install the, the DLL and, well, uh, the Tango library, the C++ library, easily. Um, okay. And then, in some other checks, there is also something that we are uh, putting in place right now, uh, which is uh, to something to check the binary compatibility uh, between what you, you're proposing and what was before in the repository. Uh, so this is important. Uh, depend on the branch because uh, right now on the nine LTS branch, we allow uh, 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 to break, the, it's possible to break the binary compatibility. But for the 9.3 uh, backport branch, uh, you cannot break this binary compatibility. So the, this test will, will have to pass. Um, this test is quite new and there is a pull request uh, to improve it. And so, but uh, yeah, this is something which is important. Then we have Sonar Cloud code analysis as well, 
which is something which is uh, running some uh, static uh, analysis tools. Uh, typically, it's claim, claim uh, well, the Silang um, an, an, a static analysis uh, tools. Um, and then from here, you can get some uh, reports on if there are some obvious uh, problems in the code that uh, was uh, in the pull request. And we can as well get some uh, detailed an analysis and uh, also some advices on improving the code and things like that. There are many, many improvements uh, which are proposed by Sonar Cloud. Um, and there is also uh, something which is uh, testing, uh, seeing uh, the code uh, test coverage. Um, okay, so what, what we want in general is to have the coverage uh, increased or not decreased. But uh, well, in some cases, it, it can be acceptable to have, to, uh, have no, no increase in the coverage. But this should be exceptional. And of, of um, and here, what is is something that I use very often when I want to test uh, pull requests. Here, you have the command line instructions uh, to potentially merge this pull request. Uh, this is very useful if you want to test a pull request. Uh, usually, I just uh, execute this these commands until here. I do. I don't do the merge in the, or or at least I don't do the push at the end. <laughs> and uh, and then this way you can test uh, a pull request uh, on your side, and then uh, eventually report some issues when you are reviewing the pull request. Okay, so. I will go back to the presentation there. Okay. So uh, as I said, there are two development branches main, mainly right now. Uh, so, so the Tango 9 LTS, which is the future uh, CPP Tango 9.4. Uh, so the latest version right now, the latest official is 9.3.4, which has been released very recently. Uh, and uh, so the 9 LTS will be the next one, uh, which is not binary compatible with 9.3. Uh, this one requires C++ 14 at least. Uh, it's not binary compatible uh, with CPP Tango 9.3, uh, I said it. Um, we have some tests with the latest LLVM uh, compiler, latest GCC, Ubuntu 20.04. Debian 8, 9, and 10. And for Windows, uh, we are also uh, testing, building with these uh, ar uh, architectures and compilers. And for the 9.3 backports, um, this is a branch which is there to support uh, the binary compatible uh, version with uh, CPP Tango 9.3. Um, we have some uh, Travis continuous integration test uh, running for Debian 7, 8, 9, and 10. And, and also some older uh, MSVC compiler, MSVC 9 here. Um, so, um, 9 uh, LTS, so I tried to find some things that I didn't say yet. Um, this is a branch which was created in 2019. Uh, um, and it's mainly the idea is to do some improvements in all areas. Um, so uh, bug fix and features, new features, uh, we can concentrate as well and improve the software quality and safety. And uh, also we are improving the, the tools, tooling and, and uh, continuous integration infrastructure on this, uh, on this branch. Um, so 
about the bug fixes. Um, on, on this branch, uh, the solution they may differ from 9.3 uh, backport uh, bug fix uh, solutions uh, because we we have no ABI restrictions and so we have more freedom in this uh, in this branch and we can follow the boys code rule and refactor. Um, and some bugs uh, are resolved, uh, are solved on, on the 9.3 back port first and, uh, and wait for uh, forward ports. Uh, this is exceptional because in general, we prefer to get some, uh, some pull requests on the, on the nine, Tango 9 LTS branch, and then we do the back port to the 9.3 uh, back port branch. About uh, contribution rules, um, there are some advices uh, in the contributing.md file that you can find in the repository. Um, one, uh, the first rule, if you want to contribute, uh, if it's not something which is obvious to be done, like a, a typo fix or, or something very simple, uh, what is important is to discuss um the additions and changes first and you can do that by creating an issue saying okay i'd like to to do that um and uh, and this is very important because you maybe someone uh, had already the same id and is already working on this topic or there is already another issue or pull request yeah uh, about this topic and we could also guide you. So instead of uh, not saying anything and do your big changes on your side and, and then create a huge pull request for at the end uh, that we say, oh, well, thanks, but uh, this is already done there or there is already someone who was working on that. Uh, yeah, please create uh, an issue. And then we can discuss, and then you can go on and and do the wonderful uh, changes that you you want to do. Um, so contribution steps they are also described in the contributing.md file. Um, so you first you the idea is to fork the repository to your own user. Um, you. This is one way of doing, there are other ways, but uh, you can add your fork as a new remote like this. Uh, you create a new branch for your, uh, the, the bug fix that you want to do or the new features that you want to, to implement. You start hacking in your branch and then you create a pull request from your branch uh, with your changes and uh, your fix should always be based on the default branch, Tango 9 LTS. Uh, there are some exceptional cases where actually you you found the bug in 9.3 branch uh, and uh, okay, you want to fix it in this branch, then okay, it's fine to, to be based on the 9.3 backport branch in this case, and you do the pull request on this branch, of course. Uh, only after accepting a peer on that branch, normally in Tango 9 LTS, we can start integrating a fix for the current stable version in the 9.3 backports branch. Uh, so this is the ideal situation, but as I said, sometimes uh, you can do it in the 9.3 backport branch and we can do a forward port of the bug fix in the Tango 9 LTS branch. Uh, this is just... Um, an extract of the contributing.md file uh, to explain the rules for pull request acceptance and merging. Um, so, as I said before, what is important is all the checks should should pass. Uh, if you have changed the behavior of the code, you should add new tests as well. Uh, it's not necessary to execute the test locally. Well, you can do it, but uh, and Thomas will show you how to do that. Uh, but you can also uh, let 
just uh, Travis do the test and then you will get a result and and then you can do an iterative process until the the continuous integration tests are, are passing. Uh, please make your pull request easy to review. Uh, so just explain what you want to do uh, and split the changes into uh, logical commits. Uh, this is very important and where each commit describes why it is changing the code. Uh, this is much. This is very important because it really helps uh, reviewing the code and makes uh, things uh, very clean uh, at the end. Uh, try to follow the coding style, uh, as you will see, and as you might have seen, uh, it, it's a bit messy at the moment. Uh, there is no uh, clear um, standard uh, code uh, uh, way. Uh, there is no real standard way of uh, indenting the code. But please, uh, if you modify a section of the code, try to follow the the indentation um, uh, style, the code style uh, of the uh, surrounding code of where you you, you change. Uh, I think we will we will change that in the in in the in the future, but for the moment it's like that. So please just just apply the style code style uh, coding style of uh, the surrounding code. Uh, your pull request needs two review approvals, including one from the code owners. Uh, so right now the code owners are Michal, uh, Thomas, and me. So you need one of us to approve it and someone else, can be anyone else. Not you, but someone else. <laughs> and uh, be prepared to adapt your pull request to the review responses. Uh, Code review is, is done for ensuring higher code quality and communicating implementation details to newcomers and not for annoying anyone or slowing down development. Um, now we'll talk about the dependencies. Um, so to be able to compile uh, CPP Tango, you need Omni ORB. Uh, it's better to have uh, something above 4.2.2. Uh, you can have a 4 to 1, but you need some patches for to fix some COBA bugs. Um, then you need uh, the OMQ as well for, for the events, because all the events are using this library now. Uh, you need CPP uh, ZMQ, uh, which is a 0MQ uh, C++ uh, wrapper, uh, which is providing us uh, the possibility to use 0MQ in a C++, uh, modern C++ way. So, and with uh, exceptions and, uh, and uh, using the resource acquisition is initialization idiom approach to resource management. And then you need the Tango IDL. I will come back later on that. Tango basically is Tango Core by Interface. Uh, you need CMake above 3.7 and C14 compliant compiler, compiler for Tango 9 LTS or uh, an older compiler for 9.3 backport branch. Um, so, uh, but the dependencies you need. Uh, you need Omni ORB, uh, which is a core by implementation in C++. Uh, so I will just discuss uh, briefly what is Corba. So Corba is, is common ORB architecture. So what is this beast? Uh, so common architecture, it's uh, actually, it means it's a technical standard. So Corba is a technical standard for something called an ORB. Okay, so what is an ORB? Uh, ORB is an object request broker. Well, you're very happy with that. So basically uh, to simplify the things, uh, ORB is, is an object oriented version of RPC. RPC is a remote procedure call, um, which is uh, basically uh, something to be to be able to implement 
to run some procedure remotely. So an ORB is a mechanism for invoking operation on an object, uh, so calling a procedure, for instance, in a different process, or re potentially remote, so that may be running on the same or different computer. Um, and what is important as well is to know that with a, with a Omni ORB, a programming level, uh, remote calls, they look similar to local calls. So when you invoke something on a remote object, it's like if you just invoke a method on a, on a local object. Um, so in Corba, there is something which is important, which is the IDL. The IDL is the interface definition language. And uh, an IDL file defines a public API that is exposed by object in a server application. So when using Tango, Tango there is only one IDL file. And uh, usually uh, it's hidden to the device server programmer and client programmer as well. But if you start to work in CPP Tango, um, you, will, you will have to deal a bit potentially with this file. It depends. It depends what you want, you need to implement. But uh, in any case, uh, we need this file um, uh, as a dependency because uh, from this file, we will be able to generate some, some code um, uh, which will be useful for Omni ORB to, to work properly and all, for all the core part and all the communication part uh, to work properly. And so here is a link to the Tango IDL file. Uh, so, and the IDL is basically uh, an API defined in a way which is independent of any particular programming language. So this is why the IDL file is in, in another uh, Git repository, because from this file, we can generate uh, C++ code, Corba code and, and Java Corba code, so for JTango, and uh, potentially for other programming languages as well. And uh, um, this uh, Corba uh, standard defined the mapping from this IDL to, uh, to many different programming languages. And, uh, and the different Corba implementations, they provide some IDL compilers to, to be able to, to generate uh, the code uh, to follow this uh, standard mapping. So, so when you have a, a variable in the, well, a type in, in the Tango IDL uh, file, then this will translate in a, in a specific type in, a, in a, the dif different programming languages. Um, so, what are these uh, stub and um, skeleton code? So let's go for the stub. Um, so um, the word uh, the word stub has several meanings. Um, um, in the dictionary, it says that the, it's the short end uh, remaining after something bigger has been used up. For example, a pencil stub or a cigarette stub. Um, in the traditional uh, programming, uh, a stop procedure is a dummy implementation of a procedure that is used to prevent undefined label errors at link time. In, and in a distributed middleware system like Corba, remote calls are implemented by the client making a local call upon a stub procedure object. Um, so, Stub uh, uses uh, inter-process communication mechanism, so TCP IP sockets, to transmit the request to a server process and receive back the reply. 
Um, very often, the term proxy is uh, used instead of stub. So this should uh, be talked to you because uh, in Tango we are using, uh, we have the device proxy class. Um, and so a Corba proxy is a client side object that acts on behalf of the real object in a server process. Um, So the proxy uses an inter-process communication mechanism to transmit the request to the real object, which is in a server process. Then uh, the proxy waits to receive the reply and passes back this reply to the application level code in the client. And then um, the ideal compiler will also generate some skeleton code. So what is that? Um, the skeleton code is uh, Basically, the server-side code for reading incoming requests and handling and dispatching the request to the application level object. Uh, so it's really something to support. Um, it's a supporting infrastructure required to implement uh, server applications. Okay. Uh, one thing important is that uh, in uh, Omni ORB, um, the IDL compiler is only IDL, and th this requires Python uh, as well. So this could be uh, another dependency which is required. Uh, you can get more details uh, about Corba in if you follow this uh, link. Uh, Corba explains simply. Uh, it's pretty well done, I think. It really helps. And, uh, and I will uh, leave the floor to Thomas, uh, who will explain how to compile CPP Tango. So Thomas, if you can sh sh start to share. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for the first part, Reynolds. So um, I am sharing my screen. So you should see. Now, yeah, uh, two things. You should see the install MD file from the repo and the uh, and the shell. And um, I've mentioned, so I'm about to show you how to now really get things installed. And first of all, um, you have to install the um, dependencies. These are um, if we so these are um, yeah um, we want to we want to compile stuff so we have to get CMake and the build essential package on so this is a Debian system um, we need yeah git um, we need so libcos4 libomniorb4 and libomnifred4 and omniidl later on are all the um, Corba libraries we, we need and the IDL generator. Um, lib0mq free def is the um, libzmq, including the C++ robber, and uh, we need also Python free, and this is for the test um, generation. And yeah, install these packages. We have in the install um, MD file, we have instructions for if you are on a platform where you don't um, have these packages pre-compiled for you, you can compile them yourself. We have instructions here. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and we also have uh, um, instructions for compiling that on Windows um, in the install MD file. So if you're on Windows, this would work as well. Okay, so we got the um, packages we need for the for CPP Tango, but we also, as um, Reynolds already introduced, we also have the Tango IDL um, repository with the IDL file. And well, yeah, um, we just create a build directory. We call CMake and then we call sudo make install, which installs the Tango IDL file in user local include. And of course you can, uh, as usual, you can use the um, generic CMake way with um, make prefix path to choose another location for the IDL file. Yeah, and then your 
going into the CPP Tango um, repository, you create a build folder. Um, although I'm now using out of uh, our, um, I'm using an out of tree um, so, uh, build. We are not yet. We we are still messing a bit with the files in the source tree, whereas uh, we have open PRs for that to fix that. So it's not. It's currently not supported to compile in parallel from the same source tree, um, different build with different, with different build directories. But that's coming, and that shouldn't be a too big, too big of a hassle for you right now. Um, and yeah, and now I'm configuring with CMake. I'm using, so we have, um, for CMake, we have various flags we support. Um, some of them are uh, standard uh, CMake flags, like if you want to build a shared library or not, if you want to enable testing uh, the build type, if you want to have a build, uh, a, re a release or a debug type, but we also have our own uh, flags, and one of those flags is uh, use P uh, PCH, and this PCH stands for precompiled headers. And this makes the um, uh, and this makes the compilation much faster. That's the reason why I'm using it here because um, we don't want to wait forever with uh, everything. Yeah, and. CMake is not surprisingly uh, not very, um, yeah, it's, it's finding everything it needs. And if it wouldn't find something, it complains and gives you a hopeful um, um, error message you can start with. And then, yeah, the usual thing you just call make, and then you're starting compiling everything. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, it should be. Yeah, I mean, it, is, it, it, it of course depends on your machine how long uh, that takes, but it's um, doing everything. You don't need to do anything else besides calling make um, it. So it does a few things. It first of all creates the, um, it, it, read, it reads the Tango ID, um, IDL file. Um, Reynold mentioned it creates, it uses the Omni IDL uh, compiler to create the C++ code for it, and then it um, we then use our part of the code to interface with that, and when we're building all the Tango objects, you know, and so yeah, um, this is uh, compiling a CPB Tango on Linux. As I mentioned, you can also compile it on Windows. Um, we have at the very bottom, we have a description how to compile it on Windows. The biggest hassle on Windows are the dependencies um, because, yeah, because uh, most, some, I mean, some dependencies are not really first class citizens on Windows, for example, like pthreads or um, also OmniOrb is a bit, yeah. Not so easy to compile, but we have um, already packages pre-made with the dependencies we also use for the CI. And um, therefore you can just grab these packages and install. And then you can, um, yeah, with the instructions here, you can compile. Um, as Reinhold already said, um, the Windows, we don't execute the tests on Windows right now. So if you are a Windows person and you want to, uh, um, yeah, you want to start contributing. This is, of course, an area we would really like to see improved. Um, whereas just, yeah, at, at the moment, we're, we're mostly focusing on uh, getting the, the Linux um, builds uh, better. And yeah, but here are the instructions you need for getting it run on Windows. And yeah, um, you, you now see, so this is now building uh, the tests. So we're pretty close to being done. And once you're, um, we have finished compilation and hopefully CMake does not have the issue of like taking five minutes for the last percent. Um, yeah, okay. So yeah, um, executing the tests is like you always do it is with make tests and it's 
of course it's make test sorry and yeah and now um what happens is so yeah so i've I've um, skipped one of the dependencies for running the tests. So the, for compiling CBB Tango, you need the dependencies um, already mentioned. But for running the tests, um, we use um, Docker for um, isolating the, um, the state of our device servers we use for testing and for the database. And so this is in, um, in the... Uh, in the background, we now pull the Docker images we need. We start them up. We um, execute the tests inside these Docker images, and we do that for every test. So um, that takes a bit. Executing the tests at the whole, it takes around, I, I don't know, it's probably like five minutes, 10 minutes, something like that. Um, we will not uh, watch now all of them, because hopefully all of them pass. Anyway, so this is not very interesting. Um, we also have in the install MD file, we have, um, if you only want to execute one of the tests, you can also, so we're using um, C test um, be, uh, behind the scenes for executing tests. And um, you can also just use the whole uh, C test infrastructure to run tests or to only run one test or get output on a failure and so on, um, all that. And um, okay, so you now can run the test, but of course it's much more interesting to see how you can uh, add a new test and um, no worries, I will not code now um, live. I'll just uh, show you something I've prepared. Um, if you uh, want to add a new test, what you have to do is you have to do two things. Um, you have to add the test into the CMake uh, lists file in CXX test. And this looks like test suite CXX test CMakes. Um, I'm in the build folder. And this is, of course, the source folder. C make a list txt. OK, so I've added a new uh, file, cxx attribute uh, atter double right. And you just need to add it here in the um, C make lists. And the file itself looks very, yeah, it's, um, it, it has a bit of boilerplate code at the beginning um, due to the test framework we're using. We're using something, uh, yeah, um, a bit ancient CXX test. And it's, yeah, and I mean, yeah, you define a class which will hold your tests. Um, you set its name. You have some, some generic setup part and then some down. Uh, taking part. And then we have one test. So I've added one test. And um, I'm just showing it now here. So this is the test. And what I'm doing is I'm, um, I have a device server running. And this has a double attribute, which I can write. And it's called double attribute write. And I'll set, um, I'll, I'll create a device attribute object. I'll set it, um, let's take the name and the value. I then write this attribute and then I read it back. And then I check, so yeah, so here I check that I don't get an assertion. When I write, I check that I don't get an assertion, uh, um, exception, sorry, an exception when I read the attribute and when I check that it, the attribute is, has um, has the correct name, has the correct dimension, and has the correct value. And yeah, and what you do after that, you, um, so at the moment you have to run CMake again because it's not, uh, it's not too clever. The test generation, this will be fixed very soon. We already have an open PR for that, so. That's not something you really need to remember, but yeah, um, you then run make and um, 
as someone already asked in the chat, um, why is it now rebuilding everything? Yeah, that, that's exactly um, the thing we, we uh, one of the PRs uh, fixes so that you don't now recompile everything because you had to run CMake and you had to run CMake because you needed to regenerate uh, the test boiler plate code. So we will not wait now until this is, um, this is compiled. Um, but um, as I've already said, um, you can then execute that test. And um, yeah, I think that's uh, all from my side. Um, and I would hand it over to Mikael. Uh, thanks, Thomas. So uh, let me share my screen. Yeah, there should be a diagram. Can 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 someone confirm that you see my screen already? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, good. So uh, in this part, I will uh, go quickly through the code architecture, and then I will show you where exactly those things are implemented in our uh, code base. And then we will have a short uh, demo or, or example what happens when you uh, issue a remote call that reads an, an attribute. So maybe let's first have a look at um, class diagram. Maybe I will uh, zoom it out a bit to show. Uh, yeah, uh, it's not it's not much because this, this part in the left uh, upper corner is actually generated code, which uh, Reynald talked about briefly. And what we have here is uh, we have this uh, object reference or stops. This is this is something generated from the IDL, and we have abstract classes with implementation. So this is a, a skeleton code or or a servant. That's how the the OmniORB calls it. And. Uh, yeah, we have we have a hierarchy of such classes. So we have we have this uh, device. We have device two, device three, device four, device five. So and this is due to uh, uh, the fact that over the years the Tango developers needed to add some, uh, let's say, breaking changes, which required uh, adding a new method, for instance. And this is also why we have, for instance, in the uh, in these objects, we have uh, multiple read attributes methods. For instance, in the device five version, we have the read attributes underscore five call. Uh, yeah, and uh, in the previous version of the of the IDL, there was a method called uh, read attributes four. But um, since different versions of Tango are interoperable, so it is possible that uh, client uh, compiled with newer uh, ideal version can talk to, to the server with the older ideal version or, and the other way around. Okay, so that's, uh, yeah, I, I won't go into the details in this generated code. One important class in the, in the generated code is the attribute value. This is uh, something, uh, in a way, it's similar to the uh, device attribute, which we, which you receive at the application code. But this is something visible only at uh, Corba level. Uh, okay, what else do we have here? Uh, yeah, we have the we have the client classes. In the client, what is important is a connection, but most of the time you are not using this, this connection because it's abstract and device proxy inherits from this connection. And uh, yeah, device proxy stores uh, uh, owning reference to this object ref, to this, uh, to this stub. And it uh, just wraps all the call uh, in, in some abstract way. So it has actually this read attributes method and under the hood, it will select correct implementation. And for instance, if we are talking to the device uh, five IDL version, it will do a remote call to the, 
uh, to the read attributes on the on the object reference with the with the correct version. We will uh, have a look at some other diagrams and the code as soon. Uh, yeah, so in on the client side, there are some other classes to support events, but in this uh, webinar we won't discuss events. There is also this device attribute which uh, corresponds to the attribute value from the from the IDL. Uh, yeah, we we have this device attribute just to not expose too much Corba to 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 the user code, and here is. Here are the classes of the uh, of the server side part of the of the Corba of the, of the Tango. Sorry. So uh, we have again hierarchy of uh, device uh, classes, and uh, again we have one for corresponding to each ID elevations, and these uh, classes actually implement the interface of the skeleton or, or the servant. So this impl class is generated by Corba. So if a uh, device proxy calls something on the reference, there is a remote call to the implementation. And actually this is abstract class. The, all, all the Tango specific methods are uh, virtual methods here and uh, corresponding method in the uh, Tango code base is called. So for instance, in this device uh, underscore five impl, we have read attributes five, which we'll look at soon. Uh, another important class, it's the, uh, it's the device class, sorry, it's, uh, uh, it's the device class class. We are using this this uh, construct to um, initialize the the device and the attributes and the commands, so it acts as a kind of a factory. If you ever looked at the code generated by uh, Pogo, uh, you will see that in your device server is a, a class that inherits from this device class and it implements all these uh, four methods for instance we have command factor which will create which defines all the commands that the device server exposes we have this attribute factory and so on uh, yeah and the device class attribute owns collections of something which is called attr class uh, and this this class actually uh, is invoked. It has a read and write callbacks, and you implement those methods. And th those methods are called uh, by the device server when an attribute is being read. So, uh, but the important thing that this is defined per class, and the um, class and the attribute factory in the device class is responsible for creating that that ATTR classes. Uh, yeah, we have some uh, classes which are specific to the device server you are implementing. So uh, you create an attribute and in, you inherit this attribute from this ATTR. Uh, you can do similar with a command. You inherit from a command provided by the CVP Tango. Uh, you have uh, your own device class, which is responsible for creating all those objects. Of course, you need also to inherit from the device. So my device in this example inherits from device five impl. Uh, yeah, and what is also important for a reading attribute is this attribute class. This is, uh, this is something which is passed to the uh, read and write callbacks in the ATTR. Uh, and this this is the object you call, for instance, set value on you. You need to call this in your in your read callback. And this attribute class is uh, managed in something called multi attribute, which is stored, which uh, each uh, device uh, instance has its own multi attribute and uh, it has its own attribute classes. So instances so. Uh, once they are created, 
uh, once the device is created, you can add dynamically new attributes to this device, but uh, other existing devices won't be impacted by this. Uh, yeah, so maybe let's uh, switch to the to the editor and let's have uh, have a look at where the things are implemented. Uh, so yeah, the headers. Uh, okay, in uh, let's maybe just yeah, you pro you probably seen this uh, already, but this is how our repository looks like. The source code is located in CPP API. Uh, and in CPP API, we have a client uh, directory and the server directory. Uh, most of the time, uh, things, uh, the definitions of things are in a headers that with a matching name. So if you want to see the device proxy, you just you just uh, look for the device proxy .h file. So this is the interface of the device proxy. Here it inherits from the connection. Uh, uh, yeah, what else? Uh, let's, uh, and, the, and the device proxy actually is implemented in uh, something called called dev API base and some other CPP files. Uh, so let's have a look at what uh, happens during the, the connection here. Connection is also implemented here. Uh, this, is, uh, this is important uh, as, uh, yeah, this, this is code which is called when you create a device proxy. And here you can uh, see that it's just, uh, we have some object reference, which is uh, specific to, to OmniOrb. And we just try to uh, to cast it to, to the course, um, to, to figure out which ideal versions it's, it is using. So we first try with device five. If it didn't work, we try with device four, then with device three and so on and so on. And this, uh, for instance, the device underscore four are just the, the stops. So this, this, this is encapsulated inside the device proxy. Yeah, and if we try all the device of, uh, ideal versions, we cannot find them. There is some error handling here. Uh, so let's have a look maybe at the generated code. Uh, no, may, let's, let's first have a look at the read attributes. Yeah, and during constructions, we, we determined the version. Here's the, the ideal version. So here we are checking and we are calling the, the read attributes. Uh, this is a core backhaul here. Uh, with corresponding ideal versions. So you, you can see over the time more arguments were added for, to, the, to this call. That's why we are, have these different versions of, of, of this method. And this is implemented. Uh, I mean, this, this file is. Yeah, we have this uh, skeleton code and this is actually how the, how the object reference is implemented. This code is generated. So most of the time you don't need to, to look at this, but this takes um, care of marshalling and unmarshalling the arguments and handles the remote call for you. Okay, so now let's uh, switch to uh, have a look at the maybe uh, with the with the server part. We will have a look at particular example. What happens when the when the attribute is being read? So I will switch to another uh, diagram, and in this scenario, we will have a simple uh, client. Maybe I will show you the client. Uh, So yeah, this is the client which creates a very simple device proxy, reads some attributes, prints the value. And uh, this is what our client will do. It, it will just call read attribute. And uh, on, on our simple server and the server is here. Uh, 
uh, yeah, maybe let's have a quick look at the at the, the server code. So this is the uh, device inherited from the device five. We need any device because it is pure virtual in the in the device five. Uh, and we have this uh, my attr which inherits from attr and here we implement our uh, attribute read logic uh, usually this uh, this um, this method if it's generated by pogo will just call a corresponding method from the uh, device implementation uh, and that's that's also this read callback does nothing but just forwards the call here to your de device class but it, this is something not enforced by cpp tango <clears throat> okay so what happens we, we already looked at read attribute this just uh, selects corresponding read attributes uh, in this case five basing on the id elevations forwards the call to the object reference, which is a, a CORBA step. And here the network call is performed by OmniOrb. So this is rather, uh, we most of the time, we are not interested in what is going on here uh, because this is internal to the, to the OmniOrb. And then we are at the uh, remote site or at the device server site. And here the, the step uh, just calls the corresponding method on the implementation. And this is what is inside the CPP Tango. So uh, if you just go through into, okay, maybe, uh, yeah, let's, let's discuss this and then I will show you uh, how this works in a debugger. Uh, so there is a read attributes called uh, we internally do some more calls to to some method inherited from uh, previous ideal versions just to reuse the code. Uh, we call uh, always executed hook. We call the read attribute hardware hook. This is probably something you already know uh, from the device server development experience. And then, uh, we loop over all the requested attributes because uh, even if you are trying to read just one attribute here, uh, we are passing an array of names. I mean, in, in this case, it will be just one element, but uh, yeah, this allows us to reuse the same logic for reading just one attribute and many of them. Uh, so um, then we have a loop over all the attributes and then uh, the device five implementation asks the multi attribute to provide the instance of the attribute class uh, using its name. First we get name, the, the, the index by name, this is internal to the implementation and then, then we get uh, the, the instance of the attribute. So this is the uh, attribute, this is internal to, to Tango. Uh, then we ask the device class and the multi-class attribute to provide us with the with this uh, uh, ATTR object. Here we are getting the um, uh, a vector of them and then uh, we ask attribute uh, what is the index of the corresponding uh, ATTR inside this vector which is defined at class level. So um, when uh, because um, this attribute is instantiated by Tango and this um, ATTR is, is instantiated by us. And there is a one-to-one -one mapping between, uh, between them, uh, attribute stores and index to, to this my ATTR. So now we, we know which uh, ATTR to use and we have uh, an attribute. So first we call is allowed on this ATTR instance then we call read we pass the attribute and the user uh, can call finally set value on this on this attribute yeah and when this calls return uh 
before it returns, actually we uh, extract the, the data from which is stored inside the attribute because the attribute owns the, 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 um, the, the data which is written inside. And we extract this data, packed it into this attribute value or attribute value list and return this over the network to the caller. And the caller now repacks this uh, list of attribute value into a vector of device attribute, which is uh, user level code. So this is how, uh, how this read attributes call uh, works. Uh, so yeah, we briefly discussed um, how how this works. Now let, let me just show you where these things are located in the code and then we will have a demo. So attribute is of course inside attribute dot, dot age. This is not uh, surprising. Uh, and the ATTR classes are defined in uh, at her desk. Something, something called at her desk. Yeah, and if you if you look for this ATTR, it is in this at her desk. Uh, what also has surprising name maybe is if you are looking where this all set value in attribute are implemented, they are actually implemented in ATTR set val. So this is uh, where all, all the set values are implemented. Okay, so let's now uh, try to run this, dev this simple device server. Yeah, so we we read this this value. Here it is created and passed to to the attribute. Uh, so now we will stop the device server and run it through. Through the debugger, uh, let's first maybe set up uh, a breakpoint here in this read method. So uh, yeah, and let's just run. Yeah, you you can see a few threads are spawned. Those are Omni or worker threads and are responsible for handling the remote calls because there is a thread pool for for this. And then run, let's run the client again. You see it hanged. Yeah, and we hit the breakpoint in the uh, in the my attr implementation. The, we are here in the read uh, method. Okay, let's check the backtrace. And here, th th this most of the time is not important for you up to, to the point where we enter the, the Tango code. So actually it's last two calls. Here is the, uh, I mean, the, there is a call uh, in the generated code, in the skeleton code to dispatch the call, there is actually uh, a big switch statement over all the methods, which will select then cor corresponding read attributes five to call, and uh, which in turn will call some other methods from uh, from the mm, inherited from other ideal versions. Uh, what we can uh, also check here is. Uh, Yeah, so we may actually try to look inside this uh, this ATTR. I mean, this AT this adder, which is passed to 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 the read callback. So we are look at this 
ADT object. Uh, and in this uh, ADT objects, two fields are important. Uh, we have the value field, which stores the CORBA sequences corresponding to different types, which, uh, which this attribute may store. And we have some, uh, and we have uh, also uh, temporary arrays for uh, also with CORBA sequences. But I mean, this this is a plain arrays, but we are using them in case of uh, read write attributes. Uh, we will see this in a moment. So uh, we have a double attribute. So let's print what is inside. Uh, value so value is actually an, a union of uh corba sequences you can see null pointers because we are we haven't used that uh all yet uh, so it's not initialized and let's also look at this um, this temporary array for for double it's also empty so let's now uh do a few steps in a, in a debugger uh yeah here we here we are calling set value let's go uh to the next step okay we uh we got out from the from the callback in the in our implementation now we are back inside the cpp tango so let's look at this uh device uh, underscore three cpp 555 line Yeah, we were uh, we were here. This is this this is the uh, vector of ATTR objects. This is the AT, This is the attribute object. We, as I said, we look it up using the index. We call the read method, and we pass the attribute to the read callback. So this read callback is exactly what is invoked uh, here in the device server. Uh, yeah, there was uh, no exceptions during the call, so we we went further. We are now in the debugger, we are now uh, here, but let's uh, then check what's inside this, these sequences. So let's uh, print, um, you can see this is the value which the device server returns. It is stored in this TMP uh double and the the value surprisingly is still not initialized this is some special case for the uh for the read write attributes because if the attribute was uh, read only this uh att value would be initialized at this point but uh here we need to do some uh yeah this is again <clears throat> This is a, actually this is a quite remote place from where we were. Uh, th this is where we are reading into this temporary uh, array, and uh, here we need to uh, add the the set point to to the returned data, and this is where the so let's just uh, do a few steps here. Yeah, we are here, this at right written value, this, the set point. Let's do one more step and let's, uh, and now we stopped at something called data into net object. Uh, so let's first look at the temp DB 
the value is still here and this uh, ATT value has been initialized. I mean, all the pointers are here the same because this is union, but let's try to print uh, This is double again, so it's DB. DB sec, and this is something internal to the Corba. This is a Corba bounded sequence, but sometimes you need to deal with them uh, in the kernel code. So let's have a look what's inside this PD buffer. Yeah, and this is our value, which will be returned from the remote code, call, uh, this exact sequence. Uh, yeah, and we uh, stepped here in this data into net object. And if we, again, in the bugger, if we just do some more steps, we, we get past this call, we again may try to print this, uh, And here you can see that the buffer is set to null pointer. It was released and uh, because putting it in for the network transfer released the sequence. So nothing is stored in the attribute right now. Uh, and this is almost the end of this, uh, of this uh, read attribute functions. There is some, uh, some logs are set here for, because the data is being copied by copied by Corba. Yeah, and we left these read attributes, no accept. Let's go back here. Uh, so we we actually uh, were there. Here the data is copied and here the remote call returns. And it goes straight back to the caller. Of course, uh, the caller, I mean the client, yeah, crashed with a connection failed because there was a timeout because we are we were in a debugging session here and the, the program execution was blocked. Uh, uh, one more thing you may encounter during debugging is that sometimes in, in some cases you may uh, get a signal handle call in uh, the device server code when the client disconnects. Uh, you will you may get a sick pipe for a broken pipe of the TCP stack. So uh, so yeah, by default, it the execution stops if seek pipe is raised. So uh, you may just set, set up it so that it does not stop. And it's no, no longer stops, it just prints info and that's all. So yeah, this is, uh, this is the read attributes call and uh, that's all from from my side. So uh, maybe, maybe I think it's time for questions. We are uh, running short on time, but still we, I okay. think we may have some. Thank, thank you, Michel. Uh, maybe first we can answer the questions which were not answered on the chat yet. Um, there was a question from Adi, Aditya. Uh, to how to col collaborate with other developers who are already working on a branch and feature. Um, I would say the best, uh, I mean, usually when someone is working on something, there is a, uh, already a pull request which is created or an issue. So the best is to comment on this issue and to synchronize the work with uh, the developer who, who is already working on this. Uh, so GitHub uh, comments are a, a good uh, way uh, to collaborate. And then um, if um, a more reactive uh, way or if you need some discussions, uh, there might be, um, it, it's possible as well to discuss uh, during the Tango kernel meetings. So the Tango kernel meetings, they, they take place uh, on the second Thursday and, and on the fourth Thursday of each month. 
uh, if you would like to participate, uh, I propose to, to send me an email or to Andy Goods. Uh, I put my, my email uh, in the chat. Uh, um, uh, I don't know, Thomas and Michel, do you have some other advices for, for this, uh, how to collaborate? Um, no, I think, I think, I mean, the, the Slack channel, uh, the issues and the forum, I mean, that's the best, that's the best way. Um, if the communication is public, so everyone can like contribute and we avoid like uh, private emails. Um, Okay, I put my email. Okay, was there some was there some other questions uh, which were not answered yet? So the CMEC, is there a way to avoid? Uh, well, I think this was answered. Uh, are there still plans to get rid of Corba completely? Uh, yes, I think uh, Andy answered as well. Uh, about the continuous in continuous integration artifacts. Uh, were you talking about uh, Travis, uh, Nick, or...? Um, I was thinking, talking about all of them. I think I probably need to be a member of the repo or something. I mean, if I... You are, you are getting much more information. I get no artifacts or no annotations are created when I looked yeah. at the um, pull requests. Um, can, can you can you share your your screen maybe so you can show? Yeah, us I, I might have been just saying. doing something wrong. Let me see. Well, the only thing is you have to be logged in to GitHub. Yeah, I am logged in. Let's see. So, what, what are you seeing at the moment? You're seeing a full screen. Okay. Uh, we are seeing uh, no message selected. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, the full screen. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'll share again. Um, okay. Sorry, I've got lost now. Uh, okay, so um, this was your fake ABI check thing. Yeah, yep. and if I you... guess get yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And if you if you click on the ABA API API compliance check below yeah. below on the left, yeah, below. No, more below. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, that one. here. And ah, interesting. <laughs> well, well, um, this doesn't have any any artifacts. You are getting you. you where you were getting all the um, the jobs that were run, and you know the, the ah, but wait, wait. Uh, well, you're on a special case <laughs> because you're on a on, on a pull request which which is changing uh, this action, and in the previous maybe, version, maybe there, in in the previous yeah. version, uh, there was an artifact. And in this specific pull request, uh, it actually removes the artifact, I yeah. think, Thomas. Yeah. yeah. So oh, you, okay. Maybe I was just... I was it was just, just bad luck. Like, you, <laughs> yeah, I think. But I was trying to follow what you were doing. You went quite fast in the demo, and I couldn't quite okay. see how you got to where you got to. That's, a, that's all. Okay. Um, right. Okay, then there was a question. Uh, are there any plans to add automatic de data type conversions? For example, in some, if uh, some attribute is int, uh, it still could be requested to be read into a double variable without raising an exception. This could increase flexibility. Uh, good question, I think. Uh, any improvement which can uh, improve the flexibility uh, can be considered, I think. Um, I don't think we have any plan to change that right now, but uh, it's something we can 
we can think about, yeah. I don't know, Michel, Thomas, do you have uh, some comments on this one? Um, I think the reason is mostly that, I mean, um, due to the way how Corba works with the data types, um, doing the conversion automatically would uh, would involve um, a penalty because you have to like copy the data and convert it and therefore they just don't do it. So we could do that on top. Um, but we could also think about, I mean, doing that in the big uh, uh, let's um, internalize Corba project um, because there we also need to think about new data types for existing Corba data types. So it might make sense to just have um, um, something like a standard any class and yeah, then uh, have some ways of um, allowing users to get the type they want. And also, I mean, and some users want no lossy conversions. Other users may want to have lossy conversions and that's all. And so there's a, that's always, if you start um, data type conversions, you have to think about that as well. Okay. And then uh, there was a comment on, on Nick who, who didn't see the, this UML, the nice UML diagrams from uh, Michel before. Um, I think it, it might be useful to, to put them in the documentation because I, actually they were created by Michel for this uh, webinar and they are, I think, very useful. And um, so we, we will uh, see if we can add them to the, to the documentation somewhere, if Michel agrees. Of course. <laughs> I mean, I can send you them right now. Just that's not a problem. Okay, and we will put as well some links to if we if we put that on YouTube, uh, we'll put some links uh, to the diagrams in the descriptions, I, I guess, and to the presentation uh, as well. Um, Is one of the RFC a good place for those diagrams? Um, good question. Hmm. Could be. <laughs> uh, we have to see because this is really some, I mean, some of the diagrams are very uh, C++ specific. So RFC is, is more uh, language independent. So uh, it's probably, it's maybe not the best place, uh, uh, but could be, uh, or maybe as an example of uh, potential implementation, but maybe not the best place. Uh, is there any questions that I'm, I missed? I don't think so. And do you have more questions? So feel free to, to maybe unmute or, and if you want to discuss uh, something. <laughs> okay. Um, so as I said uh, during the introduction, uh, we'll try to, to do one, one webinar uh, per month, about one webinar per month. Uh, and the next one will uh, will be dedicated to uh, CPP Tango. Still, uh, I think there is no clear um, um, I would say topic yet. So, if you if there are some topics that you would like to that we we present or we go a bit deeper. Uh, Maybe uh, you can you can uh, send an email to me, or or we can also discuss uh, shortly here as well. Or you can put in the in the chat what you, what you want. Or if you want to get a rehearsal on some stuff we did today, but which might have been too fast, 
or too less detailed? I mean, sure. I mean, it's not. Yes, so there are already some proposals or events pushing management, uh, singleton classes, and Tango Monitor. Okay, this is already some big topics. <laughs> I think we can we, we can dedicate one webinar easily. Already for the events, I think we can <laughs> have one one full webinar for that. Yeah, event system. Okay.